the idols never satisfied. They never satisfied. Imagine a man <clears throat> who's just been coughing constantly. Cough keeps him up half the night. He, you know, kind of interrupts any conversation that he has and is just unrelenting and finally decides to go to the doctor. The doctor runs some tests and it's lung cancer. Now imagine the doctor knows how tough that news will be to handle and so he doesn't tell his patient about the cancer. Instead, he writes him a prescription for some very strong cough medicine and says, you know, take this, you should be feeling better soon. The man is just delighted with that prognosis. He was so concerned. And sure enough, he, he sleeps so much better that night, and the cough syrup seems to have solved his problem. Meanwhile, the cancer is eating away silently, quietly in his body. The real problem is cancer. The coughing is just a symptom. Every week in churches across America, people come to church and they're coughing, they're struggling, they're hurting, stressing, cheating, lusting, spending, worrying, medicating, avoiding, denying, searching. And occasionally I'll meet with people like that and they'll go into some detail about the struggles they're having and the frustrations and the discouragement and, you know, display some of their wounds and confess their sins. And often they will point to the cough, what they believe is the real problem. But most of the time they've just identified a symptom and not the real issue because the real issue is always the same. It's idolatry. Martin Luther said, you can't break any other commandment in the Bible without breaking the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Os Guinness points out that idolatry is the most discussed problem in the Bible. It is dominant in our personal lives and irrelevant in our mistaken estimations. For Christians today, it is one of the least meaningful notions, he says, even though it's depicted as such a huge issue in Scripture, the whole subject of idols seems mostly obsolete to us today in our culture. The first two commandments, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make for yourself an idol. And we think those commandments for, were for then, centuries ago, not for today. And those thousands or so references in the, in the Bible to idolatry haven't they expired? I mean, how many of you know somebody that kneels before a statue? How many of you know somebody that bows before some kind of a stone obelisk? None of us do. Idolatry just seems so irrelevant. And yet idolatry is the number one issue in the Bible. Well, that alone ought to raise a red flag in our minds. In fact, it is found in all 66 books of the Bible. In the first five books, the Law of Moses, more than 50 laws have to deal with idolatry. In all of Judaism, it was one of only four sins to which the death penalty was attached. And idolatry was to be immediately killed. There are gods today at war for the throne of your heart and my heart. Idolatry is not dead at all. What if idolatry is not about statues? It's not about carved images. What if the gods of here and now are not cosmic deities with, with strange names? What if, what if uh, we do our kneeling and our bowing with our imaginations? or with our checkbooks, with our search engines, with our calendars, with our, our careers, with our money? What if I told you that every single sin that you're struggling with or ever have struggled with, every discouragement you're dealing with, even the lack of purpose you sometimes are living with is because of idolatry? 
the orange insert in your bulletin. I want to really encourage you to make some notes today. If you'd open your Bible to the end of the book of Joshua, you go past those first five books, it's the sixth book. So when you get to Judges, you turn back left and you're right there at the end of Joshua. Listen to what he says. Honor the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols that your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors that they serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, the culture in which you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Now, don't miss, first of all, the underlying assumption there that you will make a choice. You will serve somebody. All of us are worshipers. There's not a person on this globe that is not a worshiper. And in our text, Joshua presents us with four options of what gods they can choose to worship. But there is not, you'll notice this, a none of the above choice. Joshua doesn't go through this list and say, or you could just choose not to worship anything at all, because that's not a choice. God created us to worship. He created us to worship him. But as we've gone away, as our culture has gone away from God, we have substituted other things to worship. Worship is hardwired into who we are. It's part of our DNA. And it's true of every culture, every civilization. Everyone in every century has worshiped. As that great theologian Bob Dylan wrote, you got to serve somebody. You may be a state trooper, you may be a young Turk, you may be a head of a big TV network, you may be rich, you may be poor, you may be blind or lame, you may be living in another country under another name, but you're going to have to serve somebody, he said. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Not only do we have to serve somebody, not only are we going to worship, Paul reminds us that the choice of whom or what we worship determines our future. When he wrote the book uh, in the Bible of Romans, he said, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But we must choose. No, No choice is not an option. Wherever you go, you realize that people have chosen. You've You've chosen. It's written into our genetic code. You and I could go to third world countries where they actually still have primitive statues and obelisks and rituals and sacrifices, or you could go to the most technologically advanced cities in the world where people think they're way beyond all that religious mumbo-jumbo of of the native tribesmen. And upon close inspection, you'll find that these sophisticated worldlings worship. They're sacrificing a great deal on the altar of power, or pleasure, or finance, or science, or humanism, or intellectualism. And it's all the same. It really is. People choosing their gods and making their sacrifices. And and at the end of the day, what they're really bringing is themselves. They are giving themselves. A while ago, we sang, I lay me down, I lay me down. We are giving ourselves to God. That's a choice that we make. But everybody lays themselves down, gives themselves for what they've chosen to serve and worship. This afternoon, you just watch the ads that you see. They're marketing to the worshiper in each of us. The commercials you see will will make their products sound like saviors. The bottom line of every advertisement is, if you're unhappy or bored, if you're depressed or distraught, just buy this product. It'll save you from unhappiness. It'll put joy, excitement, satisfaction into your life. This product will deliver you from the drudgery of human existence and make life worth living. So buy this car, take this vacation, indulge yourself at this establishment, use this medication, because whatever they're selling, it will set you free. They're appealing to the worshiper in us. Life presents us a number of choices, infinite options, but there's no option to opt out. The multiple choice has no box, none of the above. We must choose what we will worship because we will worship. 
Something is going to take that place that God made for himself. And philosopher Peter Kreft put it this way, the opposite of theism is not atheism, it is idolatry. But the problem with our culture is we associate worship with religion. When we think of worship, we think of of robes and candles and rituals and stained glass and, and a bunch of music and singing and things like that. We misunderstand worship. If you've ever attended our 101 class, you'll understand the Bible's definition of worship. Worship is simply expressing my love to someone or something. Worship is the built-in human reflex to put our love, our hope, our desire on something or someone and then chase after it. You exalt something, you lift it up in your mind, you focus on it, and then you give your life to pursuing that thing. And that's why it's essential that we identify the gods that are at war for our heart. We will never defeat them if we don't first identify them. We don't typically see ourselves as idolaters because we still think of idols as some statue, as some carved image. Whatever our symptoms may be, we just have a tough time connecting those things to our heart and recognizing that the real battle is a battle of loves. It's a war for the passion of our heart. And that is why I find our our heart transformation groups, the heart transformation process, so beneficial and powerful. It gets to the heart of the matter, which is always a matter of the heart. We've got to see below the surface. We've got to see beyond the cough. But let me just say this. You can go through heart transformation. You can just sign up for that and take it like a class with your heart not engaged, just going through the motions, and it's not going to do you a a zilch, a zip, no good at all. Just as a medical doctor, in order to really understand what's going on in his or her patient, can't just look at the symptoms, but has to go below the surface using some diagnostic tests that help him or her see inside of us, we also have to see beyond the symptoms, beyond the anger, the fear, the frustration, the addiction, the lust, the worry, the shame, the deceit. We've got to be able to see into our hearts because the heart is everything. If we could just grasp that, the heart is everything in Christianity. That's why God says, guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. So how do we see the heart? Let me give you just a few diagnostic questions. And I want you to really take notes here. Because if you're involved in a heart transformation group this week, and 120 of our people, new people, signed up for heart transformation groups last week, if you're in a heart transformation group, you've got a combat journal And that combat journal is going to ask you several more questions. It's going to be a question each day to help you diagnose what are the idols? What are the gods at war in my heart? What are you most disappointed with? That often reveals where you've put your real hope. It's a good sign that something has become far more important to you than it should be, that we're longing for something other than God. He will never disappoint us. If you were to identify the greatest disappointments in your life, what would they be? Would they have something to do with your career or your family, your marriage, your children, some other relationship? I can tell you that next week there are going to be a whole gob of people whose lives are almost devastated after today. They're going to be either in Seattle or in Denver. But their life is ruined by their favorite team losing a game or losing a championship. The disappointments we experience is simply God's way of reminding us there are idols in our heart that must be dealt with. Where we put our hopes and where we put our dreams reveals our God. Second, what bothers you the most? We can get a a good insight. God's going to bring some things to your mind as we talk about these, and that's why I think it's good to to jot this down. We can get a good insight into our priorities and our values by determining what disturbs you the most. A friend who doesn't know God or a scratch on your new car? Missing your life group or missing a day's work? The church not growing or your garden not growing? The Bible being unopened? Or the Sunday newspaper laying there unread, that great big mob of paper? Your children being late for a wana or being late for school? Missing a good sermon or Bible study or or missing your favorite TV show? See, the answers to these questions is a good indicator of whether we're really setting our mind on things above 
or have it caught up in the things of this earth. Living in the most affluent nation on this globe has an insidious way of capturing our heart so that we are worshiping things and not God. See, Madonna is not the only material girl or guy on this planet. I think Christians, if they're honest with themselves, there are many who are worshiping at the altar of materialism. What bothers you the most? Thirdly, what do you sacrifice your time and your money for? The word serve appears four times in the two verses of our text there in Joshua. Who or what you serve is revealed by how you spend your time and how you spend your money. You've heard me say it many times. You show me your checkbook and your date book, and I'll tell you what's really first in your life. See, Jesus says it doesn't matter what we say, what we claim is number one. The way you spend your time and the way you spend your money shows what really is valuable in your life. If you want to put God first, give him the first thought of every day, the first day of every week, the first portion of every paycheck, and the first consideration in every decision, every choice you make. See, the choices that we make are a strong indication of what gods we're worshiping. What you choose to do for a living, how you choose to manage your money, what you choose to watch on television or at the movies, the websites you choose to visit, the people you choose to hang around with, the clothes you choose to wear, the food you choose to eat, the way you choose to spend your day off, what you, do with, what you choose to do with your discretionary time, what you choose to think or daydream about, what you choose to read, those choices. Ask yourself, what choices am I making? And you'll soon discover some of the gods that you're worshiping, that are at war with your, for your heart. Here's another revealing diagnostic question. Where do you go when you're hurt? Where we go when we are hurt provides an honest look at what we worship. Where do you go for comfort? You know, when you've had a bad day, when, when you've had an argument with your spouse or, or your child, or when you've received bad news, when something breaks down, where do you turn? Do you head to the fridge for some comfort food and, and gorge yourself on some Twinkies? Do you head to the bar and escape with a bottle? Maybe take a pill? Perhaps you bury yourself in a book, or you get lost in pornography, or in a video game, or you head to the mall to spend some money, or you ski seek escape in, in some movies. Call your best friend to let it out. Where we go says a lot about who we are and about what we worship. That high ground that we seek to escape the floods of trouble reveals our values. In the Bible, King David, he faced a lot of trials, a lot of difficulties, a lot of trouble. Some he brought on himself. But, I, you know, I love reading the Psalms because one, of one particular thing. Over and over again, David uses various metaphors for God. And in every Bible that I use in my quiet time, I, I, I did the voice uh, the last time. Uh, I'm reading the complete Jewish Bible this time. But I did the voice, and I, and I write them down in the back on, on the fly leaf. I'll write down there every single metaphor David uses for God. And listen to what the one I pulled out of the voice. God is our fortress, our strong tower, our refuge, our rock, our hiding place, our sanctuary. He is our stronghold, defender, deliverer, rescuer, savior, strength. He is our shelter in the time of storm, our soul's asylum, our rock of refuge. God wants us to run to him. He wants us to be running to his arms. There's nothing that is better than his embrace. He wants us to hide ourselves in him. He wants to, us to rest in him. That's where we go. I remind myself daily and often who he is and let him be the one that I go to when I'm hurt because he will never fail me, never disappoint me. But where we go when we're hurt is a real revealer of our heart. Thirdly, make a worship choice today. Look at what Joshua says. Choose today whom you will serve. What a, what a great... Let me just try to explode that a little bit for you. The verb tense he uses there doesn't mean that I chose at one time. It means I chose... I am choosing, and I will continue to choose. See, we will worship. God wired us to worship. And God wants us to make a choice, a conscious choice to worship him. He wants us to be intentional about choosing to worship him. Most of our culture 
has not made a choice to worship. They all worship. But most of them worship by default rather than intentionally. They stumble into what they worship. They fall into what they worship. They get caught up into what they worship. I never intended to, to, to worship alcohol at any time in my life. See, I, so that, that's the way it is. You get caught up in it. They never intended to make their job more important than God or to get enslaved to alcohol or drugs or food that they worship. They never intended to get caught up in the rat race of materialism and power and, and pleasure and success. But you see, not intending was a choice. God says, choose. Choosing this day means we appreciate what God has done. In verses 12 to 2 to 13, uh, Joshua recounts the amazing things God has done for his people, his protection, his direction, his provision, his constant care. When we would just take time each day to think, then we will spend some time thanking God for what he's done for us, for the way he's worked in our life, for the blessing, the grace that he's poured out upon us. When we gather for worship, that's one of the things we do is we just celebrate what God has done in us through Jesus. And in choosing him above every other person and realizing what he's done for our lives, we need to ask ourselves, what have these other gods ever done for us? What enduring value has the God of wealth ever brought to anyone on this globe? What enduring value? Did your worship of pleasure ever get you any real and lasting satisfaction or happiness? I don't know anybody that's pursued pleasure any more than Mick. Except maybe his buddy, Richards. (laughs) But the Rolling Stones said we can't find no satisfaction. It didn't last. What about the gods of sex? Is that any joy there more than the passing moment? Same thing with alcohol, with drugs, with food, with work. If anything, those things have enslaved us more often than not. They've robbed us and disappointed us. The gods of culture promise, but they never are able to deliver. Choosing whom we serve means we recognize who God is. In verse 19, he reminds the people that God is a jealous God. You ever wonder how God could be jealous. I remember when I was a kid, I heard, God's a jealous God. I said, what in the world? I was jealous of all, you know, all my friends had better bikes or they had better, better baseball gloves or, you know, better, better things than I did. And I was jealous all the time as a kid. But I thought, why, how in the world could God be jealous? Listen, I really found out about it, though, when I became a Christian. God is jealous for your heart because he doesn't have that. That's yours, and he will not take that from you. He asks you to give that to him. Of his, he wants you to lay it down. He won't force you, but he's jealous for your heart, not because he's petty or insecure, but because he loves you so much. The Bible says he has in mind for us. He knows what he has in mind for us. He knows the plans he has for us, and it grieves him deeply to see the choices that we make in our ignorance. It makes him jealous in the most righteous way, just like you and I who have kids that are teenagers and see them making choices that we know are going to hurt them, and it hurts us to see them making those choices. We know that there's a better way, and God does that too. It makes him jealous in the most righteous way. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases James chapter 4 and verse 5. He says, do you suppose God doesn't care about you? The proverb has it, he is a fiercely jealous lover. Listen to some of the other translations. The spirit that God made to live in us wants us for himself alone. He wants an exclusive relationship with us, just like you do with your spouse. The spirit that God has caused to live live in us wants us to belong only to God. He doesn't want to share us with anybody else. The Holy Spirit who God has placed within us jealously longs for us to be faithful. You want the same thing of your spouse. He will not share the hearts of his people with any other false gods. He is our creator, our maker, our father, the lover of our souls, whose love for us is so immense, so powerful, so all-consuming, he simply can't stand it when we settle for less than the best that he wants to give us. 
He wants you and me to have the best life possible, the best life on this globe. He calls it abundant life. He wants to lavish upon us his grace, enable us with his power, compel us with his love, and enlighten us with his wisdom. And we so often choose gods that are not only second rate and inferior, but gods that will destroy us if we keep following them. He loves us too much. His passion for us is too great to just let that happen. He won't force us, but he's fiercely jealous for our hearts. I think we should be amazed that the creator of this universe would so deeply connect himself with us as to open himself up to sorrow and anguish in the face of our rejection and betrayal. God wants you and me so that he can just pour out his grace, his goodness upon us. And that should lead us to smash all these other gods. In verse 23, Joshua says, Now throw away the gods that you have. Love the Lord, the God of Israel, with all your heart. Whatever idols you've made, whatever it is that you worship other than God, must be abandoned and demolished and destroyed because he wants a relationship with you and me. And the only relationship God is interested in with us is one that is exclusive and committed. He's not interested in an open relationship with you or me. He wants your heart, your mind, your soul, your entire self. I lay me down. Take it all. Take it, take it, take it all. He won't share the love seat of your heart with any other. If you've been trying to use some cough syrup to treat the cancer of sin that you're struggling with, the discouragement you're dealing with, Joshua says, here's the answer. Choose this day that the Lord God alone will sit on the throne of your heart. Now, I saw an article in the Associated Press. Was, I thought it was depressing. Came out of London about a British fellow. He was upper echelon, Brit, you know, Britain. He had died just a few days short of his 89th birthday. He never had to work a day in his life. You know, he had plenty of money. He didn't have to work. And so he had about 70 years, adult years, in which to be free to do whatever he wanted to do. And listen to this story. He had devoted his life to trying to breed the perfect spotted mouse. Now, I grant every man the right to breed spotted mice if he wants to, and he can get the cooperation of the mice. And I freely admit it's really his business and not mine, but when I read that, I was really troubled by that. Here's a man made in the image of God, equipped with the awesome powers of mind and soul, called to dream immortal dreams and think the long thoughts of eternity, and he chose breeding the spotted mouse as his reason for existing. Here's a man invited to walk with God on this earth, to share in fellowship with the Lord, and to dwell at last with all the saints and angels in the world to come. He is called to serve his generation by the will of God and to press with holy vigor toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, and he dedicated his life to the spotted mouse. Not just evenings, not just holidays. He dedicated his entire life to the spotted mouse, and that just saddened me. You're going to give your life for something. The question is, are you giving your life for the right thing? How much is it going to matter in eternity? How much is it going to matter forever? And when you die, is it going to matter for, for, at, at all? I'd never read Peyton Manning's testimony until this week. I always suspected he was a Christian, but I'd never really heard much about it. And he went forward when he was 16 years old at a meeting he was at with his dad and his brothers and gave his life to Christ. He said, Jesus has been first in my life ever since. Faith is number one. Football is number four. Somebody asked him, are you, are you praying to win this football game? He said, I've never, ever prayed to win a football game. In the eternal consequence of things, it doesn't matter who wins football games. Now, I'll just tell you, I wept as I read that testimony because it doesn't matter who wins football games. Oh, it matters to the sponsors, and it matters to the coaches, you know, I mean, to the team. There's a lot of money going around there, but in the eternal sense of things, it doesn't matter. When you die, is it going to matter at all? The point of this whole sermon is no matter 
what we give our life to. It will never satisfy us if it's anything less than God. We were made by him and we were made for him. And we were made to be obsessed with him. And if we obsess over anything else, if we seek anything else, until we love him with our heart and soul and mind and strength, we're not going to find real, abundant, satisfying life because he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And it is whoever has the son has the life. So as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How about you? On the connection card, I want to encourage you to realize you're worshipers. Whether you're a believer, whether you're not a believer, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your background. Everyone in here worships by choice or by default. So use these questions. Get into, the, get into the life group. Use these questions. Use, uh, use the uh, combat journal that you're going to be reading this week. If you haven't got it, you can get it in the bookstore for half price. And use these questions to determine what it is you worship. Realize making a choice is not an option. You're going you're to choose one way or the other. So make a conscious choice. In the bottom of the outline, it talks about next steps there. Make a conscious choice to intentionally and thoughtfully choose to worship God and make him the supreme love of your life. Love him more than you love any man or any woman. And then revel and rejoice and rest in his amazing love and run to him as your refuge and your hiding place. God bless you.